Hi. Today we're going to talk about a couple of oscillator systems. I've got two ping pong or golf balls here hung on strings. Those two strings are hung on a string going across a button. I put some paper up there just so you can see this cross member. I put these big thick straws around, it shouldn't make any difference so you can see this better. Um, this is a couple system. Often I use the same kind of setup to talk about resonance, uh, particularly for lower classes. I, I vary the length of one here. I've made great effort to have these things very well matched. So I made sure that was as horizontal as I could make it and that these were as nearly as possible the same length as I could make them. Uh, of course, it's still a couple of oscillator system that can be analyzed other ways, but I want to look at this very balanced system and talk about uh, what we can learn from it. And, and frankly, the math that we have to do when analyzing it is going to be easier because it's balanced and some things will cancel out or can be factored out. So essentially, finding normal modes, as I've said several times, is an eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalues give you, with some factors, things like L and G perhaps, uh, give you the squares of angular frequencies for the modes. The eigenvectors give you, in some basis, what the modes look like. And, and here, I think it's clear. I know what some of the modes will look like. In fact, this system is kind of interesting because even though it's a very simple mechanical system, what I mostly don't know about is exactly how that coupling works. Or what I should use is the height because these things are tied way up there. Should I use this length or the length of the actual tie point there or something in between? I don't know. So in a usual system, we're given a set of forces that we know about, and I've shown spring problems like that by now. Um, in this problem, I don't know what the matrix looks like. Now, I could make some arguments uh, about structure because it balances about what I expect to be equal, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to look at this eigenvalue equation, and we'll do the manipulations in class. And I'm going to argue that on physical grounds, I know what some of these modes will look like, and there are two, and I think you know that, that's also on physical grounds. Uh, I'm going to then talk a little bit about how you can reconstruct this matrix and learn about that coupling from knowing the normal modes and making the measurements that will give you the eigenvalues. After I'm done with that, I'm going to go back and talk about this a little similarly to the way I introduced resonance for the lower, uh, lower classes, and talk about if I incite a certain mode that is not a normal mode, what happens as a function of time? And again, I'm going to make some measurements, and when I make these measurements, I, I will then uh, tell you about, talk to you about what's going on. And we'll do the real analysis in class. Uh, but you'll have all the numbers you need for this from a real system, and I'll show you when I'm timing just so you know I'm being honest. Okay? So, the first thing I said was, I, I feel like there's something natural and simple here for a normal mode. Okay? And I, I think it appeals to physical intuition, probably in your own if you hadn't seen it, but I've talked about it. Uh, and if it doesn't, when I say it, I think it will appeal to your intuition. And if I pull both of these back the same way, I let them go together, that should be a normal mode. Okay, so I'm going to try it. Do the experiment. So I have to be a little bit careful at once. Bounce up and down. I want to make sure I pull the same distance. And observe. Now, this seems to keep going on with the same pattern. That is physically what a normal mode means. Now, if I'm using coordinates where this displacement from equilibrium is one coordinate and this displacement from equilibrium is another coordinate, the amplitude for that normal mode is having an equal. That marker. So 
this normal mode that I'm observing, Yeah. 
And from those, those are proportional to the eigenvalues of the matrix. Once you factor out all the L's and G's and G's, but if I didn't factor out those M's and L's and G's, the M's are the same. I keep all that over here. And those eigenvalues are just minus omega squared. Um, we know the eigenvectors, and we have a procedure now for reconstructing this matrix. And we can see now in class before, I brute forced this two, two by two system to show you uh, what I would get for uh, A, B, C, and D, and argue that it was somehow physically reasonable. This time I'm going to use a more formal procedure when we do this later in class. And I'll get the same answer, but this time I'll have numbers because we've done the experiment. So now I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, why, why all this interest in normal modes? Well, normal modes are the regular patterns of oscillation. They aren't always what's exciting. Like my resonance demonstration for lower classes, what I claim is a sort of natural way to excite the system is to take one of these and pull it back and drop it, or to hit one of these. Right? So a natural way to excite this, and I'm not claiming it's the only one, but a natural way, would be to look at something where I have some amplitude of one of them and none of the other, and I can write that in terms of the eigenvectors for the normal modes of the system that I can find out the x and y from this arithmetic, which is, in this case, very simple. E plus is there. E minus is there. So this mode is the sum of those over two. Uh, since my amplitude is really arbitrary, I can just look at the sum of those x and y take that as one. And then I can find out about the time behavior by looking at e plus as a function of time plus e minus as a function of time. writing it in this basis and then look at what trigonometry tells me or if I prefer you know, all these complex exponentials how this whole system oscillates in time and you know how it oscillates in time so, so that we can address this and do this fully formally in class what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make that excitation I'm going to have to do this twice and I'm going to try to measure the period of oscillation for one of these, okay. and then the time of the longer oscillation for when the energy goes from one side to the other, and then back. That later one takes a longer time, so I'm only going to look for one full cycle of that. Uh, but this one, it's a little hard to measure. You'll see. I'll give you the numbers, and then we can deal with it in the class. And because the system evolves through time, it's not what the quantum mechanics they call a stationary state, it's a pure eigenvector system, a pure normal mode. Uh, I should start my clock from the beginning, so I have to be more careful about that one too. Uh, so I've zeroed out my stopwatch, I'm going to pull this back in, and first I'm going to just try to time the period of oscillation for this. So, Look back here and I will start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I got something that's Within a few tenths of a second, what I got when I tried it alone, 22.6. So that period of oscillation for one of those is 2.26. That down.
maximum amplitude back to maximum amplitude, which is easier to observe. If I start from the beginning and call it this at minimum amplitude, sitting still for that instant until it's doing so again. So, stop watch up. Thank you. 